welcome to a new episode of Brew with Beckett, powered by 92 Degrees. Now, before I introduce my very exciting guest today, I just want to take a moment to say a huge thank you to 92 Degrees. Um, through their Power By initiative, they've given me the chance to make this podcast for you to hopefully enjoy listening to. Um, their Power By initiative is giving a lot of people the chance to do a lot of things that they want to, and it is not short in saying this podcast would not be happening without them. So a huge thank you to Jack and everyone else at 92 Degrees. Um, amazing people and they make amazing coffee uh, if you want to check out their coffee head over to them on instagram at 92 degrees.coffee on twitter at 92 degrees underscore their website is www92 degrees.coffee they're also on facebook just search 92 degrees and on their website there's loads of information about coffee how you're best brewing it how you're best making it the different kind of beans where they're from the taste all the stuff you could ever need Plus, you can buy your coffee, your equipment, everything from there. And if you do buy anything from there, please make sure you use the code BWB20 because you will get 20% off at the checkout. And we all love a bargain, don't we? So BWB20 for 20% off anything at 92 degrees. Now, I said uh, about a minute ago that I've got very, very exciting guests for you today, and that's right, I've got two. This is the first time I've had two people on at once, uh, and it made for an excellent conversation. My guests are former rivals, turned teammates, turned just really good mates of mine, uh, Northampton Saints stars, Lewis Ludlam and Harry Malder. We have a great chat about a pathway to the top of professional sports and how the two of them have had very different journeys there, um, overcoming injuries, overcoming mental challenges, um, we talk about where Saints are at now, where they're going, how the future looks for that club. Uh, loads of great insight, but also I really don't think you have to be a rugby fan to enjoy this one. There's just loads of great advice and interesting stories from the lads. Um, it's, yeah, a really interesting, great listen, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, before we start, though, I do just have to make you aware the few stories being told, myself included, we get a little bit excited. There's a little bit of strong language in this one. So... If that's not for you, obviously don't listen, no one will be offended, but yeah, a little bit of strong language in this one, hope you don't mind, and more importantly, hope you enjoy this episode of Brew with Beckett, powered by 92 Degrees. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Brew with Beckett, powered by 92 Degrees. Today I am joined by two former teammates of mine and two current pivotal members of the Northampton Saints squad. I've got co-captain Lewis Ludlam and I've got Harry Malander. Uh, morning gents, how are we? Morning Beckett. Very good mate, and yourself? Very good, thanks. I'm very well lads, I'm very well. Thank you very much for joining me today. I realise uh, people not knowing the boys have joined me on their day off, which is very kind of them to... Uh, to give up some time for an old friend. Now, as I said at the start, we're former teammates, but a few people may be scratching their heads because if you know anything about the three of us, we never actually played for the same club. But we all met properly and became good mates. Uh, well, I like to think good mates. You two might think differently. On uh, the England and Dre teams tour of South Africa, and we will touch on that in a minute because that's one of my favourite memories and we played with a lot of very good players over there. But... Before we were good mates, we were bitter rivals for a few years uh, because I came through the Leicester Tigers Academy and these two boys came through the Northampton Saints Academy. Now, I'm going to throw it over to you two first and then I'll, I'll regale my memories of that. I know what it was like in the Tigers Academy coming through when you play Saints. Was, was that game the biggest game of the season for you boys growing up as well? I, explain to people who don't really know what that rivalry is like. Lads, do you want to start well, Yeah, I'll, I'll start us off. To be, to be honest, that was our biggest game of the season pretty much every year and I think we probably knew every single one of you by name um I even I, I, to me, I remember a specific story about Beckett I used to drive on the way to play Leicester and my dad even my dad used to say yeah make sure you get that Charlie Beckett lad knowing he was a horrible piece of work so um we sort of grew up through the academy so I don't know if we adopted that from first team or what but um Whenever we played against Tigers from, I think it's probably under 16s, under 17s, it was always test match, wasn't it? So, um, yeah, it was an interesting fixture, always. Yeah, I, mean, I, I completely agree. It's, it's weird thinking about it now, how um, how hype, the hype we created around it compared to probably even nowadays. Um, and obviously the insights that we had into opposite opposition and, and you lads when actually we didn't really know you at that point. <laughs> oh, mate, that's it's that's such a point. Like, you'd hear, like, the tiniest little bit of a story and that would become gospel about this person. So, Lewis Ludlam has been doing this in training this week, which means we've got to do this. And, like, you're like, where... Looking back, you're like, where the hell did we get that from? 
But I remember we played you boys uh, under 18s at Welsh Road in the Academy League. Right? It was like the 20 something of December. And genuinely, the concern was if we lost, Christmas would be ruined. Like, I'm <laughs> genuinely not kidding. Like, if we, I think it was like the 20th of December, we the change would be like, we best not lose today because Christmas will be ruined. Like, we won't get over this. And you're like, Christ, you were 18 year old lads playing rugby, but it, it was just everything, wasn't it? Yeah, everything, everything. And at that point, we were all probably playing for contracts around that time anyway, weren't we? It was sort of the time where we were finding out whether we we're going to get full first team contracts or not. So it was life or death in terms of your rugby career almost. And it was Leicester Tigers as well, which the club sort of installed into you that this was a, a big fixture. So I, I reckon it was a combination of everything, maybe let the occasion get the best of some of us, didn't it, Becky? Right, well, um, <laughs> it, it got the best of some of us, but it also, it brought the worst out. So would you like to explain, Lewis, what, my, maybe the unsavoury thing I did to you that day? I'm, I'm still left with scars on my face from that game. Was it, I think it was 23rd of December. Uh, he knows, he knows the exact Becker. date. Yeah, I'll never let it go, ever. I was, I was over, I don't know, I don't know who got tackled, but, I was over the ball, like, in a good position. Like, I'd definitely been on it to warrant a turnover. And, like, Beckett's come to clear me out. Hasn't moved me very much. So he's just decided <laughs> he's going to he's gonna try and get me the ball some other way. So he's, I reckon he hit me in the face at least seven or eight times oh. in the same spot. Now, the rest I, of this, I, the rest of the story, <laughs> I'll attest to being true. I'm not sure it was seven or eight. I'd say it was two or three. It was a fa- it was a fair few times. So we okay, we've won the penalty. Ref hasn't noticed anything. I've got blood coming all down my face. I can't see out my eye. Obviously, kicked to the kicked to the line out. And the first thing he says to me was, "Fuck me, lads, you are ugly, in you." <laughs> After I've got blood hanging <laughs> all down my face. At that point, I knew Charlie Beckett was uh, was one of those. And I think every time we played since then was the. Uh, he, he was the one I was I was targeting for sure. Mate, it's such a thing. Like my my go to to call people when I'm playing is ugly, and people look at me and they're like, "Well, you're no Mona Lisa yourself." Yeah. Like, they just, they just look at me like the cheek of you calling me ugly. Um, but yeah, mate, the, those guys. Like, I used to hate and Mal. You can talk more about this. You're you're the only kicker in here. But playing at Northampton Academy, you give a penalty away on halfway, and then. Harry Mounds would roll up. He'd be like, "Oh, here we go." And he'd either put three points over or put you in the corner, and you're like, "Hang on." We're just going to cut it away on halfway, and now I'm defending my life five metres. And Mal never did anything wrong to me in his entire life. The fact that he could kick a ball well meant I hated him. Like, I'd go home and I'd be like, I hate that Harry Mounder. Just he could kick well. Because <laughs> he could kick well and he wore a Saints shirt. Yeah, That's I, it, I, used to, I used to remember when we played that I would always know that it was you putting the cheap shit on me because it would come like five seconds after the ball had gone. <laughs> there was only one person on that field that was slow enough to get there so late. And it was you, Becky. <laughs> it's almost a skill how late I get there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember, so I had a real issue when I was younger of um, tackling kickers late. It was like, I thought it was hard. I thought it was impressive. And I realised it was actually quite embarrassing. But I remember the moment it changed. It was like I did it, um, did it for the 20s in our Six Nations first game. Uh, against Wales in like the third minute and I've been the ref's been like you're lucky not to be getting red here and simbing me I've been sat there just getting abuse from like these mad Welsh people in the crowd and I was like I probably need to stop this this isn't very clever um, <laughs> so obviously you hear you hear all those stories and people listening probably like well one this Charlie Beckett's absolutely horrible and if you're still listening to pop, my podcast like fair play I, you're a better person than I am but you're probably more thinking like why the hell are these two lads on this boy's podcast when he's been so awful to them in the past? Like, he kept hitting Malander late and he's given Lud's actual scars. So, as I said, we grew up playing against each other like that and weren't particularly nice to each other, some more than others in my case. Um, but then everything's changed through our England under 18s uh, programme and especially that tour to South Africa. So, I want to start with you, Mal, because do you remember how we got to the airport to go to South Africa? I do, mate. I do. Well, we we got a text, didn't we, from or an email from the team manager, um, because they'd grouped people for travel uh, geographically, haven't they? Geographical location. So I got this text through. I've I've looked at the list, and obviously the rest of the Saints boys didn't live anywhere near Northampton. Uh, <laughs> I've looked at the list, and I've seen 
Leicester Tigers, Leicester Tigers, Leicester Tigers, Northampton Saints. And that was me with three of you lads. And I just, <laughs> mate, I, I did everything to, I, I've probably not admitted this to you before, but I did everything to try and get out of it. So like, <laughs> I remember, I remember, I can't even remember who it was, but I remember contacting the team manager being like, is there any other way I can get there? Can I get the train? You know, like, can I, can I pay for a taxi or something to get there? Whatever. Just <laughs> pay out of my own so- pocket. Yeah, mate, I was so nervous about getting in a car with you boys. And, and you'd obviously got in it first and you rocked up with this driver who had no idea what was really going on. Mate, so so I'll, t- I'll tell you what how it had gone for us till then. So we it's me, Joe Maximi and Owen Hills. And uh, we get the text through and I like, was straight in a group chat like, boys, have you seen the state of this? Like, Mal- like fucking Malinders coming in with us. Like, I'm not... Oh. So we're, we're getting, was, the driver was Gary with his Pepsi Max in his fridge in the uh, glove compartment. Yeah. Big Gary. And we're there. And, um, so Joe's in the front because Joe's six foot seven. So he gets in the front. So it's me and Hills in the back with you. So we're like, we're like, well, we're putting him in the middle. Like, he's going in the middle. So like a mile six foot five, like Mal's taller than me and he's much taller than Hilsey. So we're like, he's going in the middle with the least leg room. So when he goes, and then me and Hilsey are like, trying to squeeze him. So I just the most embarrassing thing looking back. <laughs> <laughs> and we have this, we have this, we have this car journey. I remember getting to Heathrow, and the three of us looking at each other, being like, "He, he's all right, actually." I think. But like, no, 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 no. He can't be. He can't be. He can't be. He can't be all right. He plays for Saints. <laughs> like, nah, we'll get over that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, on that, like, it was that car journey. Like, oh, actually, he's just another human being. Like, it really, really isn't isn't that different. I don't know how you felt about it, mate. Yeah, exactly the same. It was. It was. Um... A weird experience that car journey, but that was almost like the start because all of us really got on so well after that, didn't we? Yeah, because obviously yeah. then Ludge, you jump in here. We own, we fly over South Africa for for a rugby point of view, like the most the best two week, two of my favourite weeks ever in rugby. Like we're getting some of the players we had on that tour were mad, but the th- uh, three of us with um, Owen and Joe, so like the Tigers and Saints, was actually and Fishy and a few other boys kind of just got on really well, the best out of everyone, didn't we? Yeah, it was weird. I couldn't believe it when I turned up at like the hotel at Heathrow to get on a flight and Mal was sitting with you lads on the same table, just Mal and the Leicester boys. Me yeah. and Fishy rolled in, we were like, what the hell is going going on here? And then I think it, it, it must have been a day or two and before before you knew it, we were all pretty pretty close through that tour. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was an unbelievable tour. Just the the players we had and... The, the tightness of the group. I think it was the first time as like a group of young lads that we came from sort of being bin juice at the clubs to coming together and sort of working towards something and, and, and seeing how well everyone sort of got on on that camp, especially the, the Northampton and, and Tigers boys was was really exciting, actually. Yeah, like, like to give it some context, we were, what year was this? This was 2014. We had the chance to be, I think, only the second ever under-18 side to go for the whole season undefeated because we'd obviously, we'd played earlier in the season, but we'd only like meet up for three or four days at a time. So it was the first time we'd gone away, that group, for two weeks together. Um, we played Wales, where Mal did his special for the second time that season, kicked a 50-metre goal to uh, beat them with the last play. So we beat Wales, we then beat France, and then no no one at 18 goes and beats South Africa in South Africa. And that was what we had to do to, um, to have an undefeated season. We just, like, if you run through some of the players we had in that team, like, for our back row, for example... Was yourself, Lutz, World Cup player, Sam Underhill, World Cup player, and me. So two careers went one way, one went the other. But like we had those two, like Ludlam and Underhill could be the flankers for England now, any world side starting. We had um, Boise and Jack Walker in the front row, both um, Premiership players. Joe Batley, Kieran Treadwell in the second row, what Treads plays for Ireland, bats in the, in, the, um, in the Premiership week in, week out. And then what was our, who else did we have in the backs on? Were you, Mal? Like, Joe Marchant was there, wasn't he? He's international. Yeah, lo- loads of lads um, that are now playing in the Prem. I, yeah. I, mate, it's pretty much, I, pretty much everyone is, is still at it now, which is pretty remarkable, I guess. Yeah. Because most most teams, when you when you look back to kind of 16s or 18s, a lot of them drop off, don't they? Or a yeah. lot of, um, you know, like, just go different ways. Um, and... I, like it's crazy how how many lads have kicked on and still playing in different leagues or in different parts of the world now, which is quite exciting. Yeah, you've got boys all over. You've got boys in the Pro 14 in Ireland, in Wales. You've got Genos over in France. You've got lads everywhere. It's like you say, it's extremely exciting. But um, 
we we beat South Africa, by the way. They are wondering. We did. We did go undefeated, <laughs> and then we had an one hell of a night out in Stellenbosch that night. That actually, you know what? Probably best not talking about on a recording because the stories that maybe <laughs> maybe can't get out. But um, you said there, my loads of boys all over the place. I've obviously moved on massively since being at uh, Leicester. Lads have moved a lot. Two boys you haven't moved are yourselves. You've been at Saints the whole time through. Still there now. So I just want to. It takes on, it's like you knew lads, like that takes on the next bit of my plan perfectly. You two are too good at this. Um, about how it is the Saints now, obviously, as I say, you boys still there. How has it been with the, since the COVID restart, it's not been the be- easiest time results wise. So how have you boys found it, obviously playing in the COVID time? Like I was at Gloucester and I know how it's different, the, the testing, the difference of training and stuff, the social distancing, et cetera. So how have you found that? And also how, how has it been obviously having the poor run of results and hopefully coming out the other end of it now with um, with the Worcester win. So you, you you take the lead on that, lads. Yeah, I mean, we, we probably, in all honesty, struggled to find our feet post-COVID season. Um, if we're being honest with ourselves, we probably underperformed as a group of lads. So um, it, was, it was difficult and we're still sort of thinking about but trying to find the reason why. Um, and, I, and I don't know what that is still, but... Um, I think we we probably miss the atmosphere and the crowd and the occasion of the day and being a young group of players who enjoy playing with each other and like to shut the ball around. That was um, something playing at home. We got really really excited about and all of a sudden that's that's gone and you've got to find your energy and a buzz from somewhere else. And I think we probably in the beginning struggled to find that a little bit. Um, so yeah, last season probably in whole was a little bit of a disappointment with us the way we sort of started it to and then sort of carried that through and only winning one game post covid was something that was I think as a group was probably disappointing for us but um I think this this season in particular I think we've really really found our feet I know we haven't won all of our games but what's been encouraging is we've been improving over the weeks um and it feels like everyone's sort of pulling in the same direction um which is which has been good I mean I've been in been in losing teams before and I mean, we all have, and you know what it's like. You get lads um, sapping energy and um, there's bickering about if things don't doing right amongst the team. But I can honestly say, at Saints, there wasn't wasn't any of that at all. And it was everyone pulling in the same direction, anyone, everyone staying on task and sort of pulling in the same direction, which I think is a it just goes to show the sort of the tightness of the group in all honesty. I think the I love what you said there, mate. It's so important. I think how squads react to losing is actually more important to how they react to winning because everything's easy when you're winning. It's easy to have training. It's easy to do a tough session. It's easy to be sore after training and come to your recovery because you're winning. When you're losing, all that becomes a lot harder. I think testament for me was I watched the Bristol game where you lost in the last minute. And first of all, all I wanted to do was give you a big hug at full time. You look like a broken man, like just heartbroken. Yeah. Because <laughs> the way you boys played that night against a really quite phenomenal Bristol team was incredible. And I know that you win a game like that, you're not, you're no near a sore. You lose the next day, you feel just dreadful. So I wanted to give you a big hug, but secondly, I was like, I was a little nervous. I was like, that's the sort of result that can destroy a season. Like you, you lose that one like that, and that can just snowball into a season, then goes off the rails. But actually, the way you boys came back from that and now got that win against Worcester, you pushed uh, Bordeaux close, did well against Leinster as well, actually as well. And that Leinster team are incredible like so much has been written and said about them so I, I was really pleased to see you boys come back from that I think the other thing and Mal you, you can come in on this as and you've grown up obviously with your dad that was such a late you've grown up at Franklin's Gardens your whole life pretty much with your dad uh, being the DOR of I think we aren't we are now finally seeing players fully appreciate what fans do like, I think we always have but actually you take away the 15,000 screaming baseball at uh, Franklin's Gardens and suddenly you realise the effect you have on them I know I felt it at um, Kings, so I'm not having the shed there. You're like, this is really strange. I think, I think we're just seeing that. Do you think that's fair, Mal? How much do you think Saints boys are missing missing the um, the Northampton faithful? Yeah, we we are the first to admit it. We we miss our fans so much, Charlie. We we, you know, they give us so much. Um, we have an unbelievable fan base, and the the support we get from a distance, and you know at the grounds on the weekend it is incredible um, and we, we feel their frustration as well in that they can't come along because we know how important um, the rugby is to them and a big part of their lives so 
it's been it's been challenging, but we've tried our best to engage with them, haven't we, lads? And we've been we've been um, we're just desperate for it to come back. There was glimpses, wasn't there, of it of them coming back, and now that's been taken away slightly. Um, and I think that's the ultimate frustration for us at the minute is that, like you two have just touched on, we we found some form um, having having struggled a little bit, and we just want to get back out there now um, and carry that on because we've had a couple of results which, or a couple of games that have been uh, stopped again by by outbreaks in our team or opposition teams. So now we just want to get back out there um, and, and we're just all desperate to play because training's great, isn't it? But it's pl it's playing that we uh, we do this for. You know, it's, it's the Saturdays or the Friday nights or the Sundays that we really get excited about. And so, so we can't wait to get back out there. Exactly, mate. And don't you uh, don't you forget the Monday nights? They're important as well. And the Monday, oh, and the Monday nights, <laughs> um, which is yeah, actually you them. Oh, mate, no one's as many as me. Trust me. I think if uh, if there was an A League Hall of Fame, I'd like to put myself forward for it. Uh, but it's actually interesting because we talk about um, we talk about Monday nights. We talk about um, pathways stuff. I've I said both of you have been at Saints um, your whole career professionally, and you're both very much um, major members of the first team squad now, but actually your pathway from academy to the first team, from that 18 tour, was was quite different. Um, and I want to touch on that as in, normally you go, you play your 18 stuff, you play your 20 stuff, you do a bit of A-League, so A-League for anyone doesn't know, it's called the Premiership Shield now, is the reserve team league for the Premiership side to play on a Monday night. Um, you do, and then you may play a bit of cup and then Premiership, it happens quite slowly. Now, for both of you, it all happened quite quickly but in different ways, I feel. I'd be interested you, what you want to say. So I'll come to you first, Mal. It felt like, for me, watching from the outside, I was obviously so pleased for you two, my very good mates. I was so pleased to see both of you do so well. Um, we played that 18s tour. You you won the tw Junior World Cup for 20s in Manchester, which I know was home for you, which I know was very special. And then it seemed like very quickly, you went from there to, you played a little bit for the first and then bam, Harry Mander was on the team sheet every week and tearing up in the Premiership and getting England recognition against the Barbarians. And it all happened very quickly. Is that how it felt for you? Like, how was it for you transitioning from age grade rugby to, OK, now the pressure on, I'm in the Premiership most weekends? Yeah, it, it did happen. It did happen like that. Like it, um, apart from playing against the Barbars, I haven't done that yet. I've, I've just made that up then, mate. I've, I've made that up is what I've done there. So, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, so me and Lutz, having come through, I think it's fair to say mine and Lutz's experience of the academy system was very different as well. Um, you know, Lutz can tell you about that. But um, I, I kind of, mine was quite constant once I got in. I was in and amongst it in the academy age group stuff. And then, yeah, we both got to that position where we were playing 1Ds, uh, second team for Saints for a couple of seasons and we I don't know we both I, I, I'm speaking on behalf of both of us here but I think we both felt like we enjoyed that competition of well the opportunity to play first of all but the fact that we were completely out of the picture and we, we enjoyed that kind of challenge of of trying to get in it and, and trying to, to have that breakthrough to get a chance and for me it came a bit a lot sooner than Luds because well, we were both due to go out on loan and um, a couple of injuries happened in in the centres at Saints originally. And that was when I, I got kept back uh, rather than going out on loan. And, and I got a couple of games, thankfully did all right, and then and then played quite regularly from there. And then obviously that that was unbelievable, um, everything that I'd, I'd wanted from it. And... Uh, to be playing regularly in various positions and learning my learning my craft on the job really um, was great. Uh, and then since I've had a couple of big injuries which have stemmed that progress, but uh, I'm just desperate to get back on the horse now um, and, and push on with things. And it's so good, like for me, because when I started playing, there wasn't that many younger lads or, or guys that I was close with in the team. Whereas now the team is just my mates, and uh, that's what's so cool. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, that's why I want to be playing regularly because we have such a good time day to day. Yeah, mate, absolutely. And I'll we will talk about injuries and show you how to. So I want to talk more about the um, 
mental side dealing with injuries, I think it's a really interesting conversation. We'll come back to that. Before I throw to Lutz for his journey, I just want to talk about not unique, but a very rare situation at professional level is having your dad as your coach. I think we all do it when we're younger. Like Lud said earlier about his dad driving to games, being like, you've got to deal with that Charlie Beckett. I think we all had dads who were like that. But yeah. your dad, obviously, everyone doesn't know, Jim Mallander was, well, is Harry's dad. Wasn't, was, still is, I believe. Um, <laughs> but was DOR at Northampton for a long, long time. So talk to me, Mal, about what it's like coming through with your dad as your boss, because that's that's got to be really quite tough, actually, if being honest. Like, that's just ammunition. I know I used it loads. Just have a dig at you. Opposition have a dig at you. And, like, even boys, the less favourable boys in the squad, I imagine, there might be whispers behind. So how, how did you deal with that growing up and coming through with the, that, not shadow hanging over you, but that constant people can go, yeah, but his dad's the coach, sort of snarky comments? Yeah, well, so until, until he wasn't my coach anymore, I hadn't experienced anything else. Um, so for me, I mean, I just cracked on. I know that's a real boring answer, but I was just used to it and that was just how it was. I actually had the opposite of what you you guys are referring to when you were younger and your dad saying, right, you need to do this, you need to do that. My my dad was actually very um, passive in that in that regard. You know, if if I if he wanted if I wanted advice, rather, I would go to him and he would happily you know steer me in the right direction. But he was never, you know, he would never put it on me or like um, really, really push me to play rugby until we moved to Northampton from Manchester. I, I'd never played. Um, and so it was quite, quite different for me when I was younger. But then obviously, yeah, at the club, uh, with him being the coach, you do get that stuff. You get it from opposition team, teams um, and players. You get it from, um, I, I, you get it, you get it internally as well at times and you feel that heat, but um, I've just backed myself that I knew why I was there and that I thought I was there for good reason and it was my ability and nothing else so uh, I think as long as you're confident in that then uh, it, it's not really an issue and you just crack on Did you ever have any awkward moments of so we've all done it as young lads as well you think, you think you're ready before the coaches think you're ready it's always, they all, always you always think yeah, I can do this because you've got to back yourself because if you don't who will and the team will get announced on a Monday and you're not there and you go and knock on the door of the DOR and you ask why and you have a disagreement or whatever. Do you have, ever have any really awkward moments where you have that at work and then it ever transitions home or were you very good at while you were still living with your parents and you were younger but still around the first team? Were you good at like work was work, home was home? So if you had disagreement at work, you'd leave it or did it ever spill over? Occasionally it would almost spill over but my mum was that uh, barrier to stop it really she she was the um, enforcer in that she just said right that's that's not happening that's not happening we can talk about other stuff at home so that that helped massively um, yeah it's, it's always good having mums <laughs> M- mate mums mums are always the answer any issue mums are the answer um, I think so um, Lods I'm looking across to you as in you for again from the outside looking in I always knew how your career was going because we'd chat and whatever. We've got WhatsApp group with three of us that were in and whatever. But it seemed like you, quite like me in a way, were struggling to make that step up. You'd play, the, uh, you'd play in the A-League, you'd play in the um, in the LV Cup games, you'd play, you go out on loan, but we both went on loan to Coventry together, actually, like we'd be on loan. <clears throat> and then it so looked like you were struggling and then all of a sudden you weren't struggling. All of a sudden you were the best player in the Premiership and all of a sudden you were going to a World Cup for England. And like, from the outside looking in, it seemed like that all happened in a whirlwind of 12 months of, you finally got your shot, you went, well, actually, I've been this great player this whole time, look at what I can do, and the whole the rugby world suddenly realised what you can do, and now you're co-captain at Saints. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but looking outside, it all happened like a bit of a whirlwind, so how was that for you? Like, how did you feel waiting for that chance? Because I know what it's like to wait and not get it, or only get it once and be frustrated, so how did you deal with that frustration? And then, how was it when you got it and how's the last two years really been? Well, I mean, the last two years have been crazy, really. Um, if you'd have told me two years, this time two years ago, that would have been Captain Machado Club. I told you you were crazy. I was, I don't know, still out on the town in, on a Wednesday night, <laughs> student night. So um, it's, it's, it's crazy, really. I mean, I've really, um, really enjoyed the last two years, but I think a lot of that, frustration probably came out the last two years um I think you you touched on it before about going on loan and being away from the squad um and as 
a rugby player and professional athletes, you you always back yourself. You always think you should be playing. So there was, I mean, uncomfortable conversations with coaching staff and whatnot, and you always think you're ready. But um, the reality, reality it was it. I had great players ahead of me, and I wasn't quite ready. Um, it just took like 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 Mal said, similar a couple of injuries at the start of the season, and then you get your nose in, and you play one, and then you perform okay, and you get a chance to do it again and again, and before you know it, you've played a good run of premiership games and I don't know, it, it, it's, it's such a strange career because everything turns around so quickly like like that through injury or through through anything, changing coaches, whatever it might be, everything changes so quickly. So to, to sort of sum up the last two years, it's just, it's sort of just happened and I haven't really had a chance to, to look back at where I was three years ago, really. So it's been a been a bit bizarre, if I'm, if I'm honest. Can you can you pinpoint? Obviously, you said injuries gave you the chance to get in because I think I'm a big believer in. Very few people get their chance by design. It happens through injuries to other people normally, and then you take your chance. You're like, well, you can't drop me now. Was there anything that you changed either in your training or off field that you think helped you take that, or was it just that you hadn't had the chance? And then when you did, you already all like you say you were out on the town on Wednesday night three years ago. Was there a was there a change in attitude to actually, you know, this is my chance, I need to really maybe just be that little bit more professional. Like, I'm not a young lad anymore, I need to grow up into this. Was there that sort of change as well? Um, I don't think it was a professional change. It was definitely a mental change. But I think it was, it was a point where I'd one year left of my contract and I hadn't played many first team games, hadn't really performed when I had, so... Um, you know what it's like when you you see a lot of these players get to that sort of crunch point where they've got a year left in their contract and they haven't played and it, get, it gets to that point where you either, you see lads go to work in, in the business world or, you, or they go play in a champ or on, on, on that one team and they, they never really make that transition. So for me at that point, I, I probably knew for me that was sort of crunch time and I was sort of, considering well, should I should carry on doing this I really wasn't enjoying it too much so when Chris Boyd came in he sort of said well listen I'm going to be honest with you mate you're, you're not in my plans but I'm going to give you a chance to perform I just sort of said well I haven't got much to lose at the moment I can not relax but I can enjoy myself I can take the pressure off myself and just be able to rip in and and being able to play with freedom and um, enjoyment and just being able to be like, well, if it's my last year at Northampton, it's my last year at Northampton, I'm going to rip in and give it a good crack. And to go out every week and be able to do that was something that I know helped me massively. Um, and that that mindset probably transferred into the, into the World Cup stuff at the end of the season as well. I mean, I got there um, unexpectedly and... So we, we, we sat down the first day and we said we're going to set goals and I sat down with um, Edmo who was the goal setting guy there and he said oh what are your goals and I said oh well you know, so I've never expected to be here anyway so it'd be quite nice if I could stay in for the whole week and then they get to next week and it's like oh well hopefully I'll stay in for the first cut and then it was oh hopefully I'll go to the um, Italy camp just before the uh, just before the plane flies out and then it was okay let me get on the plane and before you know it you you gutted. You're not playing in a semi-final yet for for England, so it all it all changes so quickly. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, just just being able to sit, feel like I can take every opportunity as it comes, rather than thinking about what's going to happen in the future, was was something I think helped me massively as a player. Yeah, man. As you say, it does it does all happen so quickly, and things change. It's testament to you the way you've handled that frustration and channeled it into where you are now. I want you to just touch on obviously you said earlier like you're captaining your childhood club how how would you find that of your 24 25 you've got people like Courtney Laws there who's got just shy of 100 caps for England how is that ever I don't know it's different every club is it intimidating never having to cap people like that who have more experience on the pitch you, or is it the fact that you boys are a majority young squad does that help massively yeah I think probably having those big characters Courtney Dan Bigger and Alex Waller beside me doing it as well probably helps the situation. Um, they, they're they players you don't need to worry about trying to lead or trying to do anything differently with because they've been there and done it all before. And 
they take a lot of the weight off your off your shoulders for you. Big Z's always keen to speak up and, and courts as well. And I've got a good relationship with both of them. So in that regard, it probably makes my job a, a whole lot easier. It's just been um, frustrating. We haven't had more opportunities to be able to, to play and play as captain and, and, and sort of learn off these lads as well. So, um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it. Um, I haven't necessarily felt the, the pressure of it yet, but that's because... The lads have been performing, I think, and I've got and I've got some great players around me to, to lead as well. So um, I'm enjoying it, and, and hopefully we get some few more opportunities in the near future to 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 go out and do it. Yeah, hopefully so, man. You talk there about um, frustration not being able to play, which brings me back to Mr. Malander, who you've had a pretty frustrating few seasons with injury, Mal. Uh, I said, talked earlier about your rise, and I got it wrong with Barbarians, but you're in England camp. I'm right in saying that where you went to a camp and yeah, right. very much very much in the picture, and then. You've had a few injuries. Do you want to just run people through who don't know the injuries you faced the last few um, few seasons, but how you how you've reacted physically to that? But more, I want you to talk more if if you okay with it about how you've dealt with that mentally, because I think people can take from that not just how they deal with injuries, because not many of the listeners are going to go out and do their knee in the tackle or whatever like you might have, but actually how you deal with more the mental side of setbacks, because your career suddenly was going. You could see it on the upward trajectory; it was going exactly where you wanted, and then suddenly it comes crashing down because your body gives up on you. So that sort of setback, I think anyone can take from how they deal with different setbacks and different walks. Especially at the moment when there's so many setbacks being thrown at us all over the place that have been going on. How did you How did you deal with that? Because it can't have been easy. No, it wasn't. It wasn't easy at all, Charlie. And I think I've, I'd had injuries previous to these big ones. Um, and, you know, like an ankle surgery or, um, you know, like a soft tissue injury and with those you the diagnosis happens and they say to you right it's going to be a couple of weeks Harry you can't play for two weeks then you know the fix you're going to be back for or it might be 12 weeks of an ankle and and by the time you've had the surgery and you get into it it just you're there already mate it's crazy how quick it goes um and so those were those were never an issue but then I had um it had uh, some migraines as a result of concussion, um, which were very sporadic. Um, so one day I'd be feeling great, the next I'd be feeling terrible. Um, and I could do a bit of training and then I couldn't do anything. Um, and they just kept coming back uh, to the point where, you know, all the advice that I was getting medically uh, from these uh, well the, well, the people in charge were saying you need to take a little bit of time just to see if you can get this to settle down and eventually it did um, got to the bottom of it and just as I got myself back and feeling really good uh, and playing playing well I thought um, I got my big knee injury so when you've ruptured multiple ligaments and there's a few other bits going on in your knee they say right well it's going to be nine months minimum maybe a year and then that turns out to be 18 months because of a couple of complications uh, it's quite difficult but I think I would relate my approach to it or, or the, what I've learned from it very similar to the way Lutz went about you know his pro rapid progression through playing for England in that I I struggled when I was quite long-sighted and when I was thinking about coming back and when I was you know, watching loads of rugby at the start and thinking, oh, you know, I could learn this, I could do this. When actually I took it, I know it's so cliched and so boring, but when I literally thought about what I could achieve that week, and it may have been to get five degrees range in my knee in the, in the first week or whatever it was. Um, and then suddenly those weeks add up or those days add up. And by the time, you know, 18 months actually flew by, um, and by the time I got myself back, I was like, wow, that, that's gone in a way that's gone very quickly um, because of because of that approach. So that, I'm not going to lie and say it was all plain sailing, but it, there were there's some really tough times. But I think the support network that I've got around me um, through my friends and family um, and especially the guys at the club, I think that helped enormously. Uh, the support from the physio department in particular at the club has been exceptional. Um, I've had the best care I could ask for, um, and that helped, and that's and that's why I've got myself back. Um, so now I'm just like having had almost a couple of years, 
properly away from it. I've had a couple of games this season. I'm like, let's get out there, please, <laughs> please. Let let me just let me let me loose, let me play. Um, it's like at the minute I'm having to restrict my load on on training just as we get back to to playing again. I'm like, I don't I don't want to stop. I'm I'm feel I'm feeling great. Let me let me carry on. Let me like yesterday I missed what five minutes at the end of the session. I was like, let me just do yeah. <laughs> let me do five minutes. Come on, yeah. I missed enough minutes. Get me out there. Yeah, mate. And that honestly, that's so good to hear. And like, see, because like, we've spoken obviously privately, but I, I was um, between you and you going through it. I know it was tough for you. I think something you said there that's so important is about a support network. And I think whatever your issue is, whether it's an injury in sport, whether it's mental issues, whether it's uh, work-related issues, family, whatever it is, I think it's so important that everyone without even realising will have a support network, whether it's friends, family, whoever. And you do talk to them because I think especially as men, especially as macho rugby players and this bit of bullshit we feed ourselves at times, like we feel like we can't ask for help. And I think, I know I've heard, learned that lesson the hard way of actually it's fine to ask and you need to. So, I think it was great to hear you talk about your support network being so key. I think something else we've got to touch on is massive credit to you is what you've thrown yourself into off the pitch with the extra time you've got while you haven't been playing. And just want you to talk about the amazing work you've been doing with the Saints Foundation, mate, because so you Mal won the 2020 Community Player of the Year for the Premiership for the work he's been doing. He won't mention it, so I will. Uh, he's doing incredible work and that was, that was recognised by Gallagher Premiership. But... Just talk to me mate, briefly about the Saints Foundation and how you got involved and the great work they do, please. Um, yeah, so I we've spoken a bit about it before, but for those that don't know, I, I just when when I got injured, I just wanted to find something that um, I could really get stuck into. Um, obviously, my rehab was taking up a lot of my time, but the nature of it, especially in the early stages, is that you get so much free time that you. You need another focus and I do a, a part-time degree as well which I'm almost I'm finishing this summer um, so that kept me a little bit busy but I wanted someone else and I have I get on really well with the guys at the foundation and to be honest it, it only it hadn't really got off the ground um, a couple of years ago and uh, I got involved started going down seeing how I could potentially help out um, and then I started to realise as I, as I went probably weekly um, that they that they could help me a lot as well. So I, I mentored a couple of lads um, and I have mentored a couple of lads. I'm mentoring a couple more at the minute. And uh, it's not particularly hands-on, but uh, you realise like these kids that they're helping are from like, really troubled backgrounds at times and have had it really tough. Uh, their upbringings have been very difficult from abusive parents um, to you know trouble with education or involvement in in crime and gangs and the Saints Foundation the work they do is unbelievable and even more so during this period of of COVID where everything has to be distanced they've somehow managed to you know increase their interaction with the community and and help even more people which I think is unbelievable so um, yeah, I'd, I'd, anyone that's listening that, that wants to check it out, I'd really recommend that you just head over to their social pages and just have a little look, see what they're doing, because um, for me, it's given me so much back as well as hopefully helping a couple of kids out. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, please make sure you do. And anyway, you don't have to be a Saints fan, just check them out because a lot of the clubs in the Premier League, their foundation are doing great work. So if you're a fan of another club, want to check out yours as well, because yeah, especially like Mal said, through these tough times, we've got to help each other out. I am sorry if everyone listening heard me, the big idiot, just gulping on my water at the start of Mal talking. I realised I was doing it, it was quite close to the microphone. So if the boys can't edit that out, sorry if I gulped over your uh, your talk on um, on the foundation there, Mal. Uh, but no, honestly, excellent work. And it's like you say, it's so important, I think, that you give to them, but also great that you can give back to you and you're, you're finding so much out of it. You're listening to the Brew with Beckett podcast powered by 92 Degrees. Now, powered by 92 Degrees isn't just some snazzy catchphrase the guys at 92 came up with. They genuinely live it. And I want to take this moment to thank them for all the support they've given us. This podcast is quite literally powered by them and without their support it would never have happened. Now, as well as the support they give the podcast, I myself am personally powered by 92 Degrees in the, in the shape of the caffeine in their coffee. Every day I start my day with a 92 Degrees coffee. 
And um, if you want to be powered by 92 Degrees like I am, make sure you head over to their Instagram at 92degrees.coffee, their Twitter at 92degrees underscore, or their website www.92degrees.coffee. Because over there, they've got your beans, your subscriptions, your keep cups, independent coffee guides, your aeropresses, and anything else any of you coffee lovers could need to get you through your day. Uh, when you're there, make sure you use the code BWB20 to get 20% off whatever you buy. That's BWB20 for 20% off. We're powered by 92 degrees, and you can be too. Now, we could sit here and talk about rugby on pitch, off pitch, all day. The three of us just love it, but I think I'm not sure how many listeners we keep if we did that. So what I'm now going to move over to is a game you both played with me before when on Instagram uh, in the first lockdown, when we, where this podcast was born from, where a teammate. So for those of you who this is their first time listening, I'm going to ask the boys a question. They're going to reply with who they've played with at any point in their career any point uh, can can be the answer. So I'm not going to ask you, lads, who your worst fashion sense is, because the last time we played this, you both said me. And uh, yeah. this is this is my podcast, and you're not going to be mean about me on it, so we're not asking that one. <laughs> um, um, so the first question I want to ask is, obviously this podcast is powered by coffee, and while you two morons don't drink coffee, really, which I don't understand, I don't know how you get three days out without doing it. I said to them both before I came on, I was like, oh, lads, uh, 92 degrees, I'd love to send you some coffee. What are your uh, what are your addresses? And they both replied, very kind of me, but I don't really drink coffee, so it'd probably just be wasted on me. And I was like, right, okay, that's, that's going to make my coffee podcast a little bit difficult, but we'll see how we can manage it. Um, but who is the biggest coffee nose or drinker that either of you have played with? Because there is a huge coffee culture in rugby, and some of the boys that I like coffee, some of the boys really like coffee. Like, they get a bit weird about it. So I'm going to come to you first, Lutz. Who's the biggest coffee nose you've played with? Luke Cowan Dickey, without okay. a shadow of a doubt. This guy, is, he sits around the coffee machine offering to make lads coffee. He's that into it. Like he enjoys making lads coffees. I mean, he's got like a four or five grand coffee machine at his house as well. So, yeah, it's got to be a LCD himself. Yeah, Mal? For me, it's got to be Henry Taylor, uh, Beckett. He, the guy, like, at the club, we've got this lovely machine and he doesn't let anyone else near it. Like, if you, it's proper social distancing. If you come within two metres of his machine... He's he's fuming. He's like he's moaning all the time, and I think the boys. It's got to a point where the boys actually like fiddle with it just to wind him up. Yeah, um, yeah. But actually, having said that, mate, I had one of his flat whites about a week ago. Not the best. <laughs> he won't be enjoying that if he if he hears. Um, now, like you said, there, those lads are very lucky to have their fancy coffee machines. Uh, if you don't, or even if you do. Uh, at home, if you are looking to have one and you want to get some really good coffee at home, make sure you head over to 92 Degrees, either at www.92degrees.coffee or on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook as well, actually. They're on them all. Uh, they've got everything you need in their shop there. And if you use the code BWB20 when you check out, you'll get 20% off. So it's a bargain as well. Great coffee and a bargain. What's there not to like? Um, moving on from coffee, though, this one you will enjoy, boys. It's a chance for you to throw some lads under the bus. Um, who who you've played with Mal I'll come to you first here has the worst chat so that can be either around the club they're killing jokes their banter's bad they, or they, and they think it's good but they're just not funny or you can go down the line of their worst a night out try to chat up girls like it's just not working for them uh, who springs to mind with those two he fits both categories and I'm going with Alex Mitchell Right. <laughs> okay. What what does Mini Mitch have? What's his issue? Shocking. Just everything. He, you know, like name dropping his number of appearances uh, for the club to girls or whatever it may be. Like he's just the worst chat. His his brother is such a better lad than him. James. He's he's much better lad. Uh, um. So yeah. We we got Alex. We've all played with James. Um, I've never had the uh, the fortune or misfortune by the sounds of it being around Alex quite as much. When when are we as rugby players going to learn that girls don't care how many times we've played? Like when we, they, <laughs> don't, they don't care how many times or who we played with. They just they just don't care. We've got to we've got to learn that at some point. Lud, what about you? I can see you smiling away on my other Zoom <sighs> screen. Who are you, who springs to mind for you? He's he's stolen my one. I was going to say Mitch. I've seen Mitch. On a night out, showing videos of his tried to girls, 
Oh, from, from the day he's oh, he's been showing that. Instagram profiles, his blue tick, everything. Um, but if it's that... not Alex Mitchell, um, on the oh, I go on the pitch chat, it's got to be Mikey Hayward. He's just right. chirping up constantly, and to the point where you speak to people at other clubs and they're like, "What is Mikey Hayward like?" Because he's always chucking terrible chat around. So. Um, yeah, on the pitch. Have you got, uh, have you got an example? Have you got an example of Mikey's bad chat oh on the pitch? And it spring to mind. God, it's everything. It's literally everything. Like he'll he'll just scream whatever comes into mind. Um, he's he's like um, what's his name of Anchorman, like Rick. Lamb. <laughs> Lamb. <Yeah. laughs> that was Mikey Hayward. Oh dear. Um, I tell you, one I thought might come. It's it's probably not worse chat. It's just weird. It's Paul Hill who I play with England, you boys have the Saints. Yeah. He's just one of the strangest men I've ever met. Like, you'll be sat around and like, the conversation topics he comes up with are just, just incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I can't mention half the conversations uh, he, he starts, but, um, yeah, he's a <laughs> bizarre bloke, to be honest. Yeah. Um, okay, so, loads to come to you first, and then, Mal, I'm going to come to you second. You'll understand when I ask him, but you can't answer yourself here, Okay. And you're going to wonder what I'm saying, but you'll know and ask. Lods, if you had to have someone goal kick from the halfway for your life, so if they get it, you live. If they miss, you're dying. Who are you choosing to take that kick? Oh, it's got to be Mal, isn't it? It's got to be. <laughs> He's not going to say me. But, no, 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 um... I know. Mate, mate, no one's going to say you, Lods, unless they're, unless they're going <laughs> death wish. Let's be honest here. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be Mal. Mal or um, James Wilson, according to the hammer, because he can kick long distance. But yeah, one of the two. Okay. And then, Mal, who are you? As I said, you can't choose yourself. It's halfway, straight in front. The conditions are all right. Like, they're not perfect, but they're not awful. Who's who, who's kicking for you? Stephen Myler. Okay. How come? Just, just... Just the ice man, Mr. Reliable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's, he's kicked a few goals in this time. <laughs> is that is that a calm way of saying he's old? Uh, he's old. He's old. <laughs> yeah, he's old. He's experienced. He's experienced. Uh, all right, last one, lads, and it's the same one I uh, ended the last time we spoke like this with, but it's one of my favourites. Um, let's say we fast forward a few years, and you both got daughters, but they're amazingly our age somehow. I'm not really sure how it's happened but it's some weird <laughs> vortex. And they said, they said, Dad, I'd like to introduce you to my boyfriend, and you turn round. And a former teammate of yours is stood there, or a current teammate is stood there as your daughter's boyfriend. Who would you most want it to be, and who would you least want it to be, Harry Mounder? Um, I think Hilly's got to take the least. <laughs> okay, explain yeah. why. <laughs> he's just a horrible bloke, right? <laughs> and he's actually got a daughter now, so I feel sorry for her. But yeah, Hilly, Hilly's just. In all areas, just a horrible bloke. And most likely, it's a tough one. Um, I think I review would be all right. I think both of you would be all right. That's kind. Um, That's kind, Harry. Thanks, mate. That's nice. Uh, Lugs, what about you? Um, who I'd most like my daughter to bring home? Probably someone like R.C. Tuala. Okay. One of the nicest guys in uh, world rugby. Um, just chilled out um, yeah probably ace least oh god there's so many there's, there's so honestly many. so many there's yeah, so many um, that's the thing we Alex all, Mitchell we all, would be an easy option yeah we all know each other far too well like we all know way oh. too much about each other that you'd be exactly. like really so is Mitch yeah, there imagine just looking him in the eye around the dinner table oh is my Mi god is Mitch in just because you know how horribly you'd be talking to her and how he would have chatted her up and you'd just be there yeah. like, you'd be there like, how's my daughter fallen for that? Yeah, and being around that little rat day in, day out as well, I don't think I could do it. Uh, so you're going with Mitch? I think Mitch, yeah. Okay. Uh, right, well, you two have got some relationships to fix when this goes out uh, <laughs> at some point because you've got some apologies to make, but... As I said at the start, you boys have very kindly given me some of your time on your day off. So I'm going to wrap it up for you because I've kept you far too long. But before we go, I just want to ask you one last thing. Come to you first, Luds. Um, if you could have one game again, your favourite game ever, which one would you go back and experience again? Oh, ever. 
Um, I'd probably want to do a redo of our under twenties cup final against New Zealand. Oh, and um, a different different result not, this time. Yeah, different result. Just because I think there's a couple of things we would have done differently, and I don't know. That's that's that feels like the one that really got away. In all honesty, I tell you, I tell you what, I do differently that day. First of all, I try and be picked, not be twenty uh, fourth <laughs> man. That'd be the first thing I try and do. Uh, but second of all, if I couldn't redo that bit, if I was still twenty fourth man. What I wouldn't do is still be in the changing room to get my shower after the warm up when Max Clark scored his try in the second minute and missed that. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it was me. It was me. It was it was me and Owen Hills again. Always yeah. me and Owen Hills. And we've done the warm up. We've sung the national anthem on the sideline. Uh, what's the hacker? And then, as people know, it was it was summer in Italy, so it is so hot. Yeah. So I'm like, look. We're going to go and get a quick shower here and get our like, shorts and polos on so we can enjoy the game rather than just sat drifting in sweat. Because I'm like, have my head taped up as well, like ready, because you're there going, it's World Cup final, someone might roll their ankle, I've got to be ready. So we yeah. go, and get, go and get a shower. And literally, as I'm in the shower, just hear this roar and run out like to the edge of the tunnel our towels and just see you boys celebrating. And we're like, ah, oh, <laughs> shit, we missed the try. We missed the score at the second minute. <laughs> and then we, then we came out and watched it all went downhill a little bit. So maybe it was our fault on the sideline that we didn't win that one. <laughs> um, okay, that's interesting. No one's ever actually done a redo. I like that. No one's ever uh, told me what they'd redo. So that's quite a good one. Uh, Mal, what would you go for, mate? I'd probably go for the... Um... The year after your your boys' final, um, the final that we we had uh, that we managed to win, that that was just an amazing day all around in Manchester. Um, and night, day and night, we got the whole day. So um, yeah, I would take that one, please. Mate. Yeah, mate, I remember um, coming to watch that because obviously I was at home in Liverpool, so I just popped it over for me. Yeah, so many of my mates playing that because for people who don't are probably wondering why Mal played a year after us and we played the same eight teams that. The ages change and it goes on birth year, not school year. So Ludge and I are both a year old than Harry in that sense. So I remember watching that and being so happy for you all. Like so many of our age group, our, our mates were there playing. Be so happy. But also you have this slight tinge of, oh, I wish I was two months younger. Like if I was two months younger, I could be out there with them, like playing at a home World Cup. It'd be amazing. That was the atmosphere because it was played at um, Man City's training ground stadium, wasn't it? So I think it, it seated like 10,000. It was just packed with English people going mad. It was... um it was such a great atmosphere, the, the sort you want to play in. Um, lads, as I said, thank you for coming on. Um, I will let you get on with your day now. If people have enjoyed listening to you both, which I'd like to think they have, uh, where can they find you on social media just to hear more about you both? Instagram, Twitter, everything. I'm yeah, you know, just Lewis Ludlam. Lewis Ludlam, there you go. You've got to plug your handle is what I'm learning here, Ludlam. You've got to tell oh, me what your handle yeah, yeah. is. Just Lewis Ludlam. Nice and simple. Mal? Simple. That's no, just a simple Harry Malinder. Um, but, I don't post much content. I'm not an influencer like Ludge. So. Yeah, but when he, I, when he does, it's worth it. And if you, if you follow if you follow Ludge, you might get to see his dog, which is really great because he's uh, he's got a really Definitely cute will see a dog. He's got a really cute dog. Um, obviously, if you want to follow 92 Degrees, they are on Instagram at 92 Degrees Coffee. They're on Twitter at 92 Degrees underscore. They're on Facebook. Just search 92 Degrees, and their website is www92 Degrees Coffee. The podcast is at Brew with Becky on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if you have enjoyed it today, please feel free to leave us a positive review on Apple, Spotify or YouTube, wherever you watch it or listen to it. It really does uh, make a difference to us and hopefully get more people listening. Uh, lads, really thank you for coming on. It's been really fascinating chat and great to catch up. And when COVID is over, we need to get together for coffee or maybe even something a bit stronger and have a, uh, a proper catch up so uh, thank you very much for coming on and giving me your time today lads definitely pleasure mate pleasure um, cheers Beckett good luck with the podcast cheers mate I hope you've all enjoyed it this has been Brew with Beckett powered by 92 Degrees and I'll see you next week 